That's just how they figure it out. Yeah, so it's not live, it's recording, so I mean, fill it in the very end. I'll send it a file. That's fine. That's fine. We'll figure that out for the uh, Thursday event. We've got to get that on Thursday. You want that one live on Thursday? Yes. Okay. Got to be here. All right, guys. Um, So this is uh, our guest speaker today. Yeah, sure. Me? Are you sure? (laughs) (laughs) All right. Um, so everybody, this is our guest speaker for today, uh, Phil Mesnier, is that right? Mesnier, yeah. Mesnier. Um, he's going to be talking about some of the technicals uh, behind blockchain, consensus, uh, smart contracts, and the like. Um, so give him a warm welcome, and we can't wait to hear what you got. Thank you. Thank you. Can you all hear me okay? Uh-huh. All right, good. So um, I have to admit, this is my first time speaking in about two and a half years. Uh, I have been on the circuit for a while, but um, it's kind of, well, COVID shut that on, so I may be a little rough in my presentation. Uh, anyway, so my name is Phil Mesnier. I'm a software developer and a partner at Object Computing Incorporated, which is here in St. Louis. And I've been a software developer for about 40 years, almost 40 years. and. Um, I work mostly on infrastructure type code. When people ask me what I do, I say a uh, computer equivalent of pipes and wires. Uh-huh. Yeah. You know, it's not glamorous, but it pays the bills. Um, anyway, so today I I was asked to come and do a presentation. They said, we'll do some on what you know. And like I said, I know infrastructure. So I thought I'd talk about the technology behind the crypto. You know, you, you all know how to trade Bitcoin or or whatever, um, but there's actually a fair, quite quite a lot of software behind that, and uh, that's that's what we go through today. So I suppose most of you here are familiar with cryptocurrency, and uh, are you? Are, so you are probably active miners of Bitcoin or, or other. Uh, either professionally or casually, whatever. I'm, I'm just trying to gauge the levels of exposure. Um, otherwise, you're all pretty much um, interested in the concepts and maybe trading a little bit and seeing uh, how Dogecoin is doing today. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so yeah, let me just get the clicker here. Um, this is common uh, garbage, uh, copyright and crap. Um, Okay, so when we talk about crypto and, um, you know, we're really talking about an application of the blockchain. That's what, um, you know, when Satoshi wrote his white paperback, whenever he did that, oh, a little more about me. I've, I've been in the crypto world since about 2016 or 17, so... I'm kind of a newbie in that regard, um, so I, I don't have old old school experience with it. Anyway, when Satoshi wrote his white paper, he he um, ended up describing the blockchain, and so the blockchain is the is the foundation beneath cryptocurrency and distributed apps and. Dax and many other things. Um, uh, also, I'm, I'm going to apologize that these slides are more of my script. Um, so I may end up reading more than I like to, but like I said, it's been two years. So. Anyway, um, so blockchains are decentralized, typically, existing across many nodes, all of which are peers. So what that means is that rather than having a master control even, even if you have a cloud-based system, if you have centralized control, then you have centralized authority, which can be uh, denied. But when you have decentralized peer-to-peer networks, then that becomes very very tolerant of, of malicious governments or, or natural disasters or whatever, because the blockchain is all the data is replicated across all the nodes. So every one is a, is a full and complete history of, 
of all the activity on, on that chain. <clears throat> the strongest blockchains are distributed across many geographical and geopolitical domains, which is, you know, just restating of what I said, you know, having, having many players and locations just reinforces the, the, the strength of the chain. Um, blockchains provide an immutable record of changes to data set over time. So what that means is that the way the nature of the blockchain is that none of the, is that the data that's stored on the chain is very verifiably immutable. Um, I'm going to talk about how that, how that's achieved in a little bit, but um, you can rest sure that if you have some, some data history, it's stored in the, stored in the blockchain. Or then it's it's the same as what it was. Yes, sir. What's uh, that? Decentralized autonomous community, oh, okay. or, or autonomous collective, or it, it's basically it's it's a collection of applications which model a society or or a community. So you might have a DAC which is centered around a game, you know, or people. I don't know. Um, what's the one with the squares? Minecraft. Yeah. Is yeah, that different than a DAO? DAO, decentralized autonomous organization. Yes, there's the DAX and DAOs are okay. mostly similar. I'm sure there's people who are really into that that can. Yeah. Da DAOs have been all the talk about investing. Right. There's a lot of investment DAOs out there now that, that you can build as a community. So it's, it's yeah. a decentralized community. In 2019, before COVID, a bunch of us in the EOS community were talking about a, a, a Burning Man DAO. We were going we to go to Burning Man <laughs> and uh, teach them all about crypto. And that was, that was going to be our contribution. But uh, it didn't happen. Actually, a good time. <laughs> I don't want to teach it anymore. So that reminds me of another, another fun fact about myself. Um, my big entry into the blockchain community is with the EOS blockchain. Are any of you familiar with EOS? You got sued. Yeah, I got sued. <laughs> <laughs> but remember, I'm a technologist. I'm not a manager. Uh, and also, I'm a contractor on that. Yeah, but but anyway, um, my company OCI um, were major contributors to the building of the EOS blockchain. Um, we we were the team that worked eighty hours a week and interfaced with testers in Hong Kong who only worked during their day. So we'd code by the day and then coordinate tests through the night and sleep whenever we could. <laughs> and um, anyway, and when EOS came out, it was one of the most successful initial launches. Um, you know, they've had their challenges since then, but I'm, um, I'm always proud of what, what my team was able to put together. Anyway, so I'll intermix little vignettes by that. Okay, so blockchains are composed of a series of blocks which are added and validated by consensus. And so I guess I'll talk more about that on the next slides. Right. So what is a block? Uh, and also, if you're very astute, you might notice in my uh, titles and all the slides start off with what is, which is basically the theme of this. Is you know, I'll, I'll introduce a point and I'll, I'll go into a little more depth. But I try not to go too deep. Okay, so blocks are the uh, essential element of a blockchain, hence, hence the name blockchain. <clears throat> and blocks are composed of a header and a body. And so what that means is you have a data payload which is a collection of transactions, which depending on the protocol involved, 
can be arbitrarily complex. And you also have a header, and the header contains all the metadata, which links the uh, blocks together and makes the makes the uh, the chain work. So some of the key metadata elements are a cryptographic hash of the entire block. So uh, something that that I'll show in a little detail later how that works to uh, uniquely identify and ver verify and validate the block. A reference to the previous block in the chain, which is typically the head of the, the current head of the chain, and that's that's what makes the immutable um, ledger is that as you create a block and you and you uh, hash it, it includes the previous block's identity in there, and then therefore. Nothing in the history of the ledger can be changed without blowing out the hash all the way up through the rest of the chain. It also contains a nonce, and a nonce is basically a magic number which is used to uh, to add some, I guess, chaos or or um, I'm losing my losing my mind now. Um, Entropy, which which um, helps maintain uniqueness, and in proof of work chains, you'll see that the nonce is very very important. And finally, the header contains other protocol specific elements, which you know vary by protocol. When I say protocol here, what I'm talking about is like Bitcoin versus Ethereum versus EOS versus Hyperledger or whatever. That's that's the definition of the of the um, nature of the blockchain. Okay. So as I said, blocks are chained together and validated by consensus. So what is consensus? Consensus is a group determination that a proposed new block is acceptable to be the next block in the chain. There's several models of how to achieve this consensus, um, which is typically created, which is typically determined when the, when the chain is created because changing that is a really big deal. Um, anyway, so there's, there's many, uh, models and they're typically proof of something is the title of the model and you know I, I list three of the more common ones proof of work is by far the most dominant and it's it's used by Bitcoin ethereum and probably uh, I, I don't know how many others quite a lot and it's the one that you know causes you to buy Expensive equipment from crypto world <laughs> and <laughs> run run basically heaters in your basement to hopefully crank out a, a winning a winning block. Um, proof of work uh, requires doing a, a calculation which has which is hard to. Uh, which is hard to, to solve and easy to verify. Proof of stake is another more, very common um, um, model. And proof of stake is where you, he who spends the most makes the most because the more, the more resources you stake for the, for the blockchain, for the network, the more probability, the higher probability is that your blocks are going to be added to the blockchain. The third one is delegated proof of stake. It's not as popular, but it's something that um, I worked with on EOS. And delegated proof of stake, like proof of stake, boils down to who's got the most money, but it's not. It's not. Um, um, it, it's the money or the resources <clears throat> become uh, voting votes and you vote for delegates 
And so it's not the stakeholders that do the block, the block production, it's the delegates who do the block production. And unlike um, proof of work where anyone in the world can turn on a new miner and, um, add, and add, the, add that node to the network and be able to uh, start earning tokens with delegated proof of stake, you actually have to put yourself out there. You, you run a campaign basically to uh, convince the stakeholders to vote for you because you're going to do the best. You're going to have the highest performance, the most memory, and the um, most resist, resilient network or whatever. And you get voted in. And then with true proof of stake consensus, the, mine, the, the block producers are actually scheduled. So everyone knows who is supposed to be block, producing blocks at a given time. And if there's problems, like they fail to produce their blocks, then everyone knows who to blame and who to uh, knock out of the production. And that's that's actually, uh, well, with, with EOS, for instance, the advantage was very high performance, potentially thousands of transactions per second, which is achieving close to, uh, you know, high-end commercial credit card processing speeds. But on the downside, is it sets a it sets a potential of latency due to bad actors who only want to be scheduled and don't you know they, they lie about their capabilities and uh, end up giving the blockchain a bad name. Um, so can anyway, I ask a question about yeah. how this applies from a practical standpoint? I'm sorry if I'm. Dumbing it down. Oh, no, no, no. This right. is my, my level. But so what I'm looking at is proof of work, proof of stake, or delegate proof of stake. Proof of work is where Bitcoin, Ethereum, live, right? uh -huh. is the most onerous, uh, compu heavy right. standard, right? And then these lower standards will compute faster and cheaper. Uh, and I guess the reason I, I, I want to know from a practical standpoint is is everything moving towards these proof of stake, uh, delegate proof of stake? As a, as a novice, do we want to stay at the proof of work level? Do we want to stay on the blockchains that are at that higher level of computation? Because this is what drives gas fees and stuff like that, too. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, the question is, is everything going to stay at proof of work, or do we need to start looking for blockchains that leverage some of these lower thresholds? Well, I'm a technologist, not a prognosticator. So <laughs> using that as a caveat, uh, I would say that, I would say that uh, I don't know that, that proof of work is going to be abandoned because it has two very strong advantages. One is anonymity. Anybody can start producing blocks and competing with everyone else. Um, and the other is, what is the other? Well, it's it's there, um, you know. It's it's the incumbent, um, but it's it, it it's well known. It's established, and it's egalitarian. And I guess, I guess as a corollary to the anonymity is, you know, it doesn't require a schedule or it doesn't require any of these things like proof of stake. Proof of stake requires that you go out and invest heavily in the um, particular chain that you're interested in participating in. And proof of stake also has a risk of, you know, allowing for potential dominating of the, uh, of the mining pool because if you have a, so you have a consortium of bad actors who collaborate to um, you know, dominate the market and get 51% holding, then they could potentially you know, control the, the whole chain and create, you know, tweak the, tweak the, the, 
the gas price or something like that that favors their transactions over other transactions, things like that. All right, I appreciate that. I didn't mean to derail it. But no, I, no, no. My no, question is no, around when we mainstream this stuff, it's got to be quicker and, and cheaper, right, to, to transact. So is this where those where that latency and that cost, I guess, is, is is being driven. Well, it's, that, that's, it's, just maybe. it's, it's all know, it doesn't it's, have to get. I mean, like if you look at Bitcoin, which is the slowest proof of work around, I mean, they have the Lightning Network built on top of that for the throughput. So, I mean, there's different trade offs with each one, whether that be decentralization through proof of work rather than an inherently centralized proof of stake where once somebody with deep pockets can just buy it all up, you know, uh, and control it, kind of like he was saying. So, it just kind of depends on what your objective is, I think. But you're asking a great question. Sorry to interrupt. I just need to know is this stuff I need to look at and then understand better. So, but I appreciate the assurance. Go yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. Don't let me derail it. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm gonna slow us down. Well, no, it's it's okay. I I, I <clears throat> like the uh, questions because that makes it makes this less of a, more of a conversation and less of. Oh, is, a, is delegated proof of stake? Is, does that have anything to do with like governance, or is that totally different? Government and governance in what context? The short answer is yes, but the long answer is how. It depends, it depends on how. So, so with delegated proof of stake, uh, also known as DPOS, um, you have your stakeholders who elect the block producers, and so you might have um, you might have twenty one block producers. So yes. Uses 21, but it could be any number. All the good markers are over here. Oh, okay. I'll come over there. Whatever. So. So you have a series of block producers here. And these guys are all connected whatever anyway so to to become one of these you have to convince a majority of stakeholders to vote for you which means um, putting out white papers and about your abilities and what you're going to do with your earnings and you know what, what great people you are <laughs> and also what, what great hardware you're using, <clears throat> infrastructure and redundancy and so forth. And then the top 21 vote getters all become active block producers. They, they become part of the schedule and they're, they're called on when their time slot hits and then they get to produce the blocks during the slot. Then you have a second tier of what are called standby producers. And standbys are the top vote getters beneath the 21. And so they are basically hot standby. So that if one of the 21 falls out of favor, then say he gets axed, then this connection then the schedule would be updated to um, include that guy. Now, when I say schedule, it, that sounds like a central authority. Um, well, the way this this is produced, and this goes back to your governance question, is the scheduling algorithm is is processed as part of the blockchain, and so it's decentralized just like everything else. <coughs> I'm sorry. Um, so blocks, you know, some of that protocol specific data on the header of the block is deltas to the schedule. And so you can actually go back in time on say the EOS blockchain and look at the, every change to the scheduling algorithm, to the schedule of block producers throughout the lifespan of the blockchain. So you can have a record not only of the data and the transactions that were imposed by the users of the blockchain, you can see the changes imposed by the blockchain itself. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. 
All right, so let me move on. Any other questions about consensus? All right, so I mentioned uh, hashing a little bit, but what are hashing, signing, and encryption? These are all uses of cryptography. So I'm gonna spend the next few slides talking about encrypting crypto. And so these three, uh, these three functions are hashing, which is used to generate unique identifiers, uh, encryption, which is used to obfuscate a set of data in a reversible fashion. And signing is a means of verifiably declaring the validity of a set of data or, or to irrefutably assert an authorship over a message, for instance. In today's crypto environment, both encryption and signing rely on public key encryption. And what I mean by today's crypto environment is public key is very secure now, uh, but when quantum computing uh, hits, the, hits the scene, we're going to have to figure out some other crypto method mm -hmm. because apparently quantum computers make make light word of, work of guessing the uh, guessing the pair pair of a key pair. So let me go through these in detail. So what is hashing? Hashing has many uses in the blockchain. But mainly it's used for, um, I guess most famously, it's used for computing the, for being the work and, and proof of work. So hashing, uh, hashing functions are typically implementations of well-known algorithms such as SHA-256. And so what that means is you want to publicize and make sure that everyone knows what algorithm you use to hash so they can match that and verify that they uh, verify that your data is, is true. So hashing values are a one-way transformation of the, of the data. And you have a data set and you hash it, you get a result which in the case of SHA-256 is a 256-bit uh, number, and, and when you, regardless of how many times you apply that function to that set of data, you'll always get the same result. So that's, that's how you can easily verify the, uh, the a new block that's produced even though it might take 10 minutes for the uh, miner to produce that block, it only takes you know, a fraction of a second to verify it. <clears throat> so uh, also the uh, third, third key element is small differences in the input data result in large differences in the hash result. So when you change something, when you change anything, whether you modify a space to be a tab or, or change it one to a two or something like that or or more practically if you're doing mining calculations and you change the nonce which is a random number which I'm not sure if it's 32 or 64 bits but, uh, it's small compared to the rest of the block but you get a dramatic change in the size of the out in the, in the output which allows for the uh, <clears throat> implementation of the uh, Bitcoin uh, level of difficulty uh, rule. So <clears throat> Bitcoin mining, when you create a, when you, you, you end up, you have a requirement that the, the hash of the block has to have a certain number of leading zeros, whether that's 10, 20, 30, 40, whatever. Um, and so that's what that's what makes it very difficult to find the result. But you can have a block that's whatever, 64K or 
or 64 meg. I'm not even sure what what the detail, what the maximum of these days is in block, Bitcoin blockchain. But you can have that large amount of data that's fixed and only tweak this small, you know, four or eight byte number and maybe if you're lucky, you hit on a hash that starts with 40 zeros and then thus gets you a um, is it 12 and a half Bitcoin now? Is that the reward for miners still? Or is it, no, I think it's lower. Has it, has it happened uh, again? 6.25? Yeah. Six, six yeah. and a quarter? Well, six and a quarter these days is still no. Nothing to sneeze at. Anyway, so um, the other half of this is that validators can very quickly compute the hash because when you publish, you publish your solution, um, it's very easy for them to run through the hash algorithm once and be able to say, yes, this, this hash, this, this block is valid. Okay, so now let's talk about public key encryption a little bit. Um, <clears throat> and again, if, if I hit on a topic that you have questions about, please don't hesitate to ask. I'm, I'm happy to have conversation with us. So PKE or public key encryption is the basis for encryption and message signing. It's it's an effective way of to protect sensitive information. And uh, anyway, so the the model for public key encryption relies on a pair of keys which um, Allow a data set to be transformed so that it can, so that it's obscured and only can be um, um, decrypted or, or made clear by by the comp complementary key. So typically, you have your key pair, and you want to you want to uh, keep one one key secret because, of course, if you publish both your keys, then anyone can spoof messages or decrypt messages and read them or whatever. So it's very, very important when you have this key pair that you keep one key private and then the other one you can publish and write it on the side of a wall or put it in a book or email it with without regard because because you're going to share that with anyone that you want them to be able to send you data. For you to be able to send that and that peer um, encrypted data, then you need their public key as well. So public. So uh, yeah, basically, let me set up a drawing here. So each each node in the network has its own private key. Uh huh. Okay. Sure. In, in fact, it'll have several, and each user each user creates an account. Um, if you're on a blockchain that supports accounts, will also have their own private key, or at least, or could have multiple ones. And in fact, some some blockchains allow for. Uh, multiple keys to be used in, in conjunction with each other, either in consensus or in unison. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Anyway, so when you have a key pair, you have a public key and a private key. And so we have Alice and Bob say. So Alice shares her public key with Bob. Bob shares his public key with Alice. And 
you had, you had set this up before um, some requirement to uh, communicate. Maybe you maybe you create a entry on the blockchain where you publicly expose your well you expose your public key that way, and so for us to send a message to Bob, or more accurately for. Bob to read a message that that was posted by Alice at some point. Um, Alice would use EPUB to encrypt. And then only Bob can decrypt that message. And if it's a live connection, so you're going over a socket or something, then you could have um, two-way communication. And Bob, in this case, would use Bob that to, to serialize or to encrypt the message. I'm sorry, I'm seeing your way. No, 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 no. Uh, to encrypt the message to be sent back. So this way you have two-way encrypted data, uh, data transfer. Now, that in situations where you're doing live communication over short-lived connections, it's kind of tedious to set up a very, yes, question? Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. I saw a hand go up. And, anyway, uh, so it's, it's a little tedious to set up these key pairs. Um, you know, I, and to share them and so forth, just just for a quick socket interaction. And so fortunately there's an algorithm that's incorporated in this secure sockets called Diffie Hellman. And Diffie and Hellman are a couple of researchers who came up with a key pair uh, a key pair generation scheme that works um, basically temporarily. So you don't have something that's stored locally, but you have something that is created when when a secure connection is established. And this is how, for instance, we use HTTPS, which is almost universal now. Um, so protocols like <coughs> HTTPS, or uh, maybe an old school guy like me using SSH for secure shell, or SCP for secure uh, copy. All these secure socket layer um, connections make use of the Diffie Helm algorithm. So that way you don't have to worry about plugging in your public key or your private key to uh, encrypt the data. It's just done automatically for you by the infrastructure. Mm. So that's how you can that's how you can use uh, your browser to connect to a website and like to your bank website or something like that. And you see the little HTTPS and it just works. And so that's that's using Diffie Helmet. Okay, so signing signing is um, done to irrefutably assert authorship. So back to my Alice and Bob example, let's say Alice wants to send a message to Bob and prove that the message that he receives is exactly what she sent and that she sent it. And so message signing is, well, it, it uses, it, it's the creation of a signature which is added, that's basically metadata to your message, which is based on the message itself. The signature contains at least a, a hash of the message created. So like I was talking before about the hash codes, uh, this, Uniquely, uniquely validates a particular collection of bits, which are the 
the message itself. And then you might have other metadata in the signature, but the signature then is encrypted using the using the sender's private key. So this is different than the encryption of, of the obfuscation of the message itself. So here you have a private on the signature. And the message. All this would then be sent over to Bob, and Bob would have access to Alice's private or public key, and so he can he can then use the public key to decrypt the signature, get the hash out of the signature, and then use hash verification to validate the message itself, and, and be able. To and be able to be confident that the message, in fact, contains what Alice sent him. Okay, so that's signing. Any questions? This, this. So is I got. I have just a general question. So yeah. you're giving us a much deeper look at how blockchains are built than I've ever seen. It's really interesting. Really hard to get my brain around. But who's doing this? Who's all these things that you're talking about is object computing are you building a blockchain and this is who's doing this and how many blockchains are out there and will one emerge as eventually emerge as the blockchain you know kind of how no there, there won't be there will always be there, there'll always be a number hundreds. of blockchains out there. and that blockchain so, isn't the only kind of encryption mechanism there is either okay but it is emerging there, as there are other there are other protocols okay right so more, more generally, about here, like HTTP, like you're talking about accessing websites, is essentially me. Well, it's uh, that, that just was was a secure protocol that, that popped to mind. Mm. Um, it's not necessarily. In fact, it is related because there, there. To get to your question, who's who uses this? It's used in in, for instance, in intranodal. Intranodal uh, communication. So, you know, when I had a internal node to node, node to node, oh, right? So, these aren't. so th that's that's the infrastructure. That's and so all all this all the what I'm talking about here are piece parts that are used in uh, various contexts related to crypto in general. Okay. So, like for instance. For instance, the oh. signing is used when you have, a, a, let's say, a client app that wants to, um, you, you, you wish to execute a trade, for instance, and so you want to send a message to a trading contract, and you want to sign that message so that way the trader is able to verify that you were, in fact, the the approved and authorized person to execute that trade. Okay. So you got a question? Yes, yeah, so I was going to say, so we would be familiar with like a public key, like a wallet address, pretty much. I'm sorry? Kind of like share between you think like a like a public key would be like a wallet address. Well, a, a wallet address is sort of a higher level concept. This, this key, these keys would be contained within a wallet. So, um, you know, and, and with a well-constructed and rich environment, you personally may not actually engage with the, private, the, the key pair directly. It might be a situation you use a wallet. I think like Scatter, for instance, um, did this, where when you create when you create a wallet instance, it says, you know, you have to create some entropy. So, wiggle your mouse, or or maybe it takes the current time in the millisecond, you know, or takes the current time in milliseconds and rounds, rounds that off or something. But anyway, so it, it would generate this key pair, <coughs> and then you might have 
like a hardware wallet, which actually uses uses um, uh, segmented memory, so that only you know, so that so that even if someone steals your device, they they can't um, they can't get your private key. Um, but anyway, so so your your wallet might manage the key man the key creation for you and so you would share your wallet address say for you know you you give me your your wallet address for me to send you a bitcoin or something and the infrastructure would be able to interrogate the wallet to get the public key or you know whatever to do the validation necessary to successfully invoke the transfer. So, yeah, this this is what I was what I was trying to say is there's a whole lot of business that happens under the covers, and so I'm trying to reveal a little bit of that. But there's there's a whole lot more that I can't cover today. For sure. Okay, so, so that's science. We want to see what my next topic is. All right, so what is a wallet? We just, we just covered this. So basically, a wallet is an app that assists with the task of security, locally, locally critical information, and safely communicating this information with block, blockchain as needed. So like, like I just, just said, your wallet is going to take care of all the dirty work because this was something that um, I, I got acutely familiar with with the development of EOS because you know, we had to do key generation and key management before we had wallets. And it was tedious. There's, there's several steps and it's easy, easy to forget passwords and whatever. So the wallet makes makes all that better. Um, and then, like I said, of course, wallets can be <coughs> standalone, which which is fine. You know, your phone. I have a wallet, on, or at least one wallet on my phone. And uh, some some phones have uh, yeah. secure secured enclaves for storing secret data. Um, so that's fine. Oh, do you, do you think CR codes will be around for a while, or, or do you think there's something different? CR codes? <coughs> QR codes, that's right. QR yeah, codes. like that one up there. <laughs> um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> QR, QR codes seem to be pretty handy, yeah, especially with your, with your phone. <clears throat> um, I don't know if any of you uh, remember the QCAT from a few years ago. You know, Black Stairs. No. <laughs> uh, that was that was a pre QR code novelty where um, you had a little device that you'd hook up to your laptop or your computer. When you're reading a magazine or something, you could scan it scan a special uh, QR-ish code and get advertising data. It didn't last. There's a scam out there now that they're making stickers of QR codes oh, at yeah. a coffee shop. They'll put a sticker over it and then once you scan it, then it'll bring all your, your information to the, to the scanner to you. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, so moving on. So the next level of concepts are contracts. And so contracts are really the brains of the blockchain. Um, contracts are what make the blockchain do something useful. So we've got all this all this infrastructure laid, all the pipes and wires. And you can connect them and you can communicate with them securely. 
but so far I haven't talked about how you can actually do anything with it. And so the contracts are the thing that you actually uh, interact with and, uh, to create transactions. And so transactions are the result of executing contracts. Contracts may be simple, so you have the, the Bitcoin um, blockchain and um, token transfer, which is pretty straightforward. And that's that, you know, until things like Lightning Network and other other annotations were added, that is basically all you can do. Um, you can also have what are called smart contracts. This was Ethereum's um, breakthrough innovation was the definition of a smart contract. And what a smart contract is basically an application code that runs on the blockchain. And so the yeah, language is platform dependent when you talk about smart contracts. So Ethereum smart contracts. Language actually is more rather than what the programmer types in is what actually gets executed. So, so Ethereum runs runs code which is similar to Java bytecode, which is a, a EVM code, Ethereum virtual machine, and they they support a, a language called Solidity to produce the to produce that bytecode, but they can use other you can create the appropriate compiled modules using other kind of other languages. Um, but it depends. So EOS is also a smart com smart smart contract platform. However, it uses WebAssembly or WASM as its executable language. And C is the coding language for that which was real convenient for people like me because I already knew C++. And so I could get in there and create contracts for you straight away, whereas even though I can do a job if you put a gun to my head, I never really worked with Solidity. Um, anyway, so smart contracts run in a rights-restricted sandbox. So it's actually validated when you create, when you try to load a smart contract to the blockchain, the code itself is inspected and validated to make sure that it doesn't do anything um, damaging. So you can't, you can't run code, for instance, that reads, reads data files from the, from the node that it executes on, or for instance, runs uh, an infinite loop, which deadlock, you know, would potentially deadlock the uh, process. Um, this looks like. Um, my throat is out of shape for talking. <laughs> <laughs> So take, take a let, let me ask the group a question because I'm I'm trying to contextualize this into something that because this is fascinating and I've, I've never seen this type of exposure. But what I want to do is I want to come out of here and say, okay, what what how, what do you do with this information? And and I'll give an example. Maybe this is where we're supposed to be going. Maybe it's not. But I'm thinking about um, does this influence us as you know entrepreneurs on what blockchain we want to participate. <laughs> And the example I have is like I'm, I'm participating in a virtual course that takes place on the Solana blockchain because it originally was planned to be in Decentraland, but Decentraland is too slow, the latency is too great, and so they moved it over to the Solana blockchain. I'm like, well, what the heck is Solana blockchain? Why is it, how is it different than, than Ethereum blockchain where Decentraland sits? It sounds like you're describing those differences. So in so much as you can or anybody else can, tell me how this information can help me select you know, the right worlds to, to play. And why would I invest in land in, in Decentraland or Sandbox that's built on Ethereum if Ethereum's not going to end up being the blockchain? 
that when it, have these when it comes to smart contracts um, and like applications and use, Ethereum is far and away, far and away the front running incumbent leader. Okay. Um, so for volume and for the security of having a like a working group of consumers, Ethereum is by far and away the leader right now. But there are lots of other blockchains coming up that support uh, real smart contract applications. And they have a little bit less trade offs. I think the biggest thing is understanding the, the trilemma of blockchain between security, power consumption, and speed. Um, it's very difficult to have all three of those to be, be totally secure, so not take up too much power, and to be fast. And usually you have to give up some part of that. So it's like a slider power. You just get a little here, so get a little bit and there. And by getting one of, more of another one, you're going to sacrifice it. So pick two. Yeah, yeah, basically choose two. And two. There, there are some blockchains that are solving the trial of better than others. Um, for Solana's purposes, I think they, are, they have really good speed and pretty good security, but the decentralization is a little bit lacking. Uh, there are not very many validators on the network compared to a lot of the others. But um, realistically speaking, I think that's what you got to kind of add up and like weigh is what's most important to you and where's the development headed uh, as far as like where's the adoption. It's going to be your biggest question, I think. And for the most part, entrepreneurs are on Ethereum. Right that's now, where uh, that's where other entrepreneurs are, and that's where you can transact. It's since 2018 or 19. It's been like, like I said, basically the only place you can run smart contract applications. And the only real downside of it there is the fees are really, really high. It's really expensive yeah. because they're solving all the problems otherwise. Um, and now people are trying to bring those fees down to make it more friendly to regular traders and regular investors. And that's like I said, you have to give up something. Yeah. Really to do that so that's what that's what the competition and that's what the fight is right now is that all these platforms are moving forward trying to trying to solve the trifle of that central um yes I, I don't know if you're going to get there mm -hmm. but uh i found in an education sense the layers the power hierarchy as i call it to be very uh <laughs> enlightening uh who are the level of one players in the world who are the level two and what's the difference the players. Uh, I don't know if your presentation is going to go into that. So no, I'm wait. not because I, okay. like I said, I'm I'm a technologist. I I don't. That, yep, that's that's a, that's a different a different uh, dimension. Mm -hmm. Okay, we can do it offline. So yes. I have another question about smart contracts. So, sure. is a smart contract is it just literally like um, almost just like a function that kind of just it, it, each node, node it can be a whole, it's typically a whole collection of functions. So you have a smart contract that, well, I'll talk about uh, NFTs later, but NFTs are, are a perfect example of a smart contract. And so they have an interface which allows you to identify, you know, to, to get metadata about the NFT, like the uh, creator's name and the, the token ID, ID and um, the value and so forth. But it also has um, action functions which allow you to assign ownership or to trade ownership or to uh, um, identify the, the uh, intellectual property behind the NFT. Um, and I guess another example, so when when I was actively teaching um, smart contract programming for EOS, I used an example of a tic-tac-toe game where you could, you would have actions. So, so smart contract, rather than calling, rather than talking about functions, you talk about actions. And so you invoke an action by well, calling a function, but, but then invokes an action. And what that action will do is transform the state or, or return some value. And, and so, you know, you might, you might have a, you know, a tic-tac-toe game where you have, where you have moves and turns or, you know, turns that whether I'm going or you're going and a move is where, where you place your X or I place my O. And that's data that transforms the state of the game. And so basically that's that's what a smart contract is. Um, so smart contracts, getting back to my slide now, 
um, basically you can do pretty much any sort of thing you can think of. You can um, manage transactions of, of simple value, so, you know, Bitcoin or whatever, or you can potentially manage, you know, you can play games with it or you can do um, um, real estate or, or do uh, real estate transactions or high value sort of transactions. You can, I guess, do any sort of, well, FinTech. FinTech is all about the smart contracts. Um, yeah. So the smart contract contract itself is actually like in the blockchain? It's like in the Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I think maybe just for simplicity's sake, um, the concept is basically just automating an if then. Yeah. Function, more or less. It's basically just automating the idea that if this trigger, if this condition is satisfied, it triggers an action, just like you were talking about. Um, but it's it's autonomous, so it, does, it can just happen automatically. If you submit the correct input to the blockchain and therefore to the contract, it's going to execute whatever has been programmed to do automatically. So. Yeah, it's it's a little more general than that. You know, you can have. Uh, I mean. In that any, any sort of application code can run so long as it doesn't violate the terms of the, the sandbox it's running in. So you can you can also you know trigger other contracts. So you know sort of like what you're saying, if a certain condition is met, maybe you fire an action on another contract which um, tallies some some events or something. Um, anyway, I kind of lost my train of thought. So, any other questions? Right, let me move on. So, we're actually getting kind of close to the end here. So, tokens, you know, I guess y'all know what tokens are. Tokens are the crypto, in the crypto domain, are an identifiable element that associates with some data managed by the blockchain. So that's a long-winded and generalized way of saying that tokens refer to something. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't want to say tokens are just like Bitcoin because that, that sells them short. I mean, a token can represent anything. A token. A token can represent um, a state of a game, or it can re represent value that you can ch exchange. Or Con even, contract. Or it can. Well, it's 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 a participant within a contract. So uh -huh. a token, a token may be manifest by a contract, but it's not. It would, well, I suppose depending on. Your definition of contract. So, if I have a contract with you to mow your lawn or something like that, we could have a token which encapsulates that agreement between you and me. So, I suppose that way it could be a contract. But you'd have a contract on the blockchain which manages that token. So, that, say, we sever our relationship, we would invoke an action on the blockchain to say that we're no longer in in uh, agreement or whatever. Like invalidating the token? Yeah. Anyway, so tokens tokens are just like you know, just like the, the coins from the video game arcade back in the day. They may not have value intrinsic to themselves they represent value so when you go to the arcade you could buy four tokens for a dollar or sometimes they give you a deal and they give you five tokens for a dollar that was always a rare treat <laughs> but basically that abstracted rather than the games being a quarter the games you, you bought a fixed number of games for a fixed price and depending on where you went or how, how much you bought, the value would vary. Mm -hmm. And so 
tokens are just like that. So I'm eventually watching. everything will be tokenized. I I would imagine so. I would imagine that as time goes by and you know, maybe it'll take another ten or twenty years. But eventually I think blockchain technology will just just be there. Just like you know, nowadays everyone has I imagine probably everyone in this room at least has high speed internet. And it's just it's just a service. It's just there. It's just available. And you know, ten years ago that was a novelty. Twenty years ago it was almost unheard of. You know, I remember when DSL was first made available in the St. Louis area, and boy, that was fast. <laughs> That's right. that, right? <laughs> yeah, whatever it was, which was a fraction of. What it is you know? I don't even I don't even know what my performance is on my network now because it's higher than what I need. So I think that you know, given another given enough time, this sort of technology will be just as ubiquitous. You know, in commerce nowadays, I guess maybe because of COVID or whatever, but. I almost, I'll, I'll go months without pulling a dollar bill out of my wallet. You know, purchase things. Mm -hmm. So much is done online, which is probably a bad thing, but, you know, and if you look at you cross side now, if you try to spend a lot of cash. Um, so, Blockchains do not necessarily need to define a token, um, but most do. So you, so tokens, tokens are a layer above the, the blockchain itself. Blockchain can run perfectly fine without a definition of a token, but you use tokens. Tokens are the easiest way to uh, provide operating capital, for instance, for for blockchain users, so your, your gas on the Ethereum blockchain or um, you know, whatever kind of incentive prices. The EOS blockchain actually tokenizes CPU, memory, and network bandwidth, so you can, you can stake EOS tokens against each of those. So when you execute contracts, you can you may have to pay something to get data storage or pay something to get CPU time to get to execute to execute your contract in time. Um, anyway, so getting back to this. Tokens one 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 example of tokens are Ethereum's ERC twenty standard. And so What's really useful about that is it's a standard definition of a token. So anyone, you all in this room could all create your own tokens and create them to the ERC-20 standard. And any, any wallet that's, that understands that standard would be able to um, interact with your token straight away without having any special code changes. Um, Anyway, so yeah, that's, that's having kind of standard. Maybe. Move on. All right, so what are NFTs? NFTs are non-fungible tokens. Is anyone in here not familiar with NFTs? No, that doesn't mean All right, well. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this slide. I'm running out of steam myself. Um, anyway, so NFTs basically are the latest fad, and they're, they're the encapsulation. They're similar to um, ordinary tokens, except they uh, they contain some metadata, some some data which 
uniquely identifies a, a resource that may not be on the blockchain. So NFTs right now are in vogue for um, encapsulating and wrapping um, pieces of electronic or digital art, which may be good or bad, but that's, that's what the current trend is right now. But NFTs are also generally useful, I think, for encapsulating, again, any kind of entity in the real world. So if you had an NFT for this pointer, for instance, you could uniquely you could assert your ownership of that pointer against all other pointers that are just like it. So say there's many Logitech pointers. This one here is mine because I have this NFT which that NFT has a signature which is bound to my private key. And so that's how you can uniquely identify. And while this pointer may be a trivial thing, you have NFTs again that go into higher order things like, you know, for instance, who has access to your medical data or who, um, who owns this building or uh, anything like that. Okay. Any, any questions? If you're wrapping up, I have an unrelated question to, from NFTs back in consensus. I think yeah. he's got a question got, slide. Oh, you got more time. Go yeah. <clears throat> so I wanted to talk about off-chain storage a little bit. So this is this is kind of the highest highest level thing. So like I said NFTs can represent any, anything that's accessed locally or you know, on the blockchain or off the blockchain. If it's off the blockchain, uh, or I guess content content that's able to be stored on the blockchain is um, is managed or is, is bound by by size. You don't want to put a 10 megabyte image file on the blockchain because you'll end up spending huge amounts of uh, staking, whether it's gas prices or, or other staking or network to share that because, as I said before, uh, early on, blockchains share all the data between all the nodes. So if you have a, if you have a large body of data, you probably want to store that off chain and then just have a small <coughs> identifier or token as it were that you can then put on the on the chain that you can access that data. So off chain storage is necessary, but it raises an important concern. How do you guarantee provenance of, of that immutability when it's not part of the blockchain. Well, there are companies out there that are solving this problem. I identified a couple here, storage, are we an IPFS or sort of the leading providers of off-chain storage. They give you many of the same characteristics that you find in the blockchain. They, Guarantee immutability and decentralization and uh, access. How's an off chain provider be centralized, though? I mean, isn't that, isn't that the definition of centralization? Is it some kind of off chain provider? Well, that's that's one of the goals of, of these implementers is to decentralize the data. So, uh, for instance, you might have IPFS, which um, takes your data, slices it up, and and disperses it across the network so that. And to access that, you still have to go through the centralized provider as opposed to blockchain. It's right. Completely decentralized. Well, I think it's important to Isn't it more so corruptible, though? Blockchain doesn't actually have to be decentralized. Like, you can operate a centralized blockchain, in theory, but you cannot, like, for instance, IPFS is a less centralized 
blockchain than something like Ethereum or like Bitcoin was. Uh, but so it's really, a blockchain is just a ledger of technologies, and like theoretically, you could operate your own validation nodes. And it doesn't inside like your own centralized entity, and it still qualifies as a blockchain. It just wouldn't necessarily be decentralized. It's not. All right, so blockchain is not synonymous with Correct. decentralization. Uh, most of them are, for most of our purposes, they are. But just to clarify that that requirement, just because it is a blockchain doesn't necessarily mean that it's fully decentralized. But as a novice, you know, I've been sold the bill of goods that the decentralization is the key benefit to the blockchain, right? So, so, so I guess there's purposes for a centralized blockchain. And that's what like, CBDC is trying to do. Like, it's where they, the government has a blockchain. And you're using theirs, and they control everything. So yeah, that's like, counter to the whole point of this thing. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 All right, no, that's interesting. That's a good one. Yeah. 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 It's going to reshape the world. It's just like who has the power? Is it going to be like centralized entities, like big tech and big government, or is it going to be decentralized? Yeah, and I don't know. I mean, I again, I'm a novice, but to me, you know, you got somebody like Meta going out there inventing the the metaverse. Well, that's as centralized as it gets, right? They already command fifty percent of the uh, uh, digital ad spend, right? And it's just going to be a manifestation of what what Facebook is, right? It's going to be a centralized, you know, revenue generating. So it's got to be decentralized. Same with government. You can't have done that. Meddling. And I, I, and I don't know. I'm, I'm way out of my depth here, so sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I mean, anyway, so finally, what was that? I was going <laughs> to call it study TF. But anyway, so just to recap this morning, I tried to illustrate some of the tech behind crypto. Started with the blockchain itself, which is the foundation, and that uses some consensus model, which depends on the protocol, data validation, and is ideally hosted on many nodes spread across the globe. So, you know, like like we were just talking about, you can have widely dispersed, or you can have localized. But having a blockchain on a single node, of course. Someone can trip over the power cord on that and take a note of your blockchain now. Or you can have it dis distributed so that a meteor strike may take out 100 nodes. you got 100 million others still out there. Uh, then we talked about um, some of the higher level concepts like uh, wallets and you know, encryption and so forth. And finally, we talked about high level concepts like contracts. And, tokens and NFTs and data storage. So, any questions? <clears throat> Is a node basically just a computer? It uh, abstracts to a computer, but it could, be a, it could be a whole collection if you have redundancy, you can have fallback, and, uh, or you could, you, you could can, uh, a node is a single networking entity. I may have multiple hosts. So it could be in more in one spot, I guess. Yeah, well, typically, typically, typically um, yeah, it, it could be. I mean, but, but ideally, you consider a single, it's a single logical computer. Okay, so finally we come to the end. Um, thank you for listening. And any questions? I, you were... I did have one on the going back to the consensus, and I think you sort of mentioned it. Uh, that switching mechanisms is uh -huh. uh, is quite the complicated task, but that's like what Ethereum is planning on doing. Right yeah, now. exactly. And, what, and what do you see from your perspective as to? Uh, I mean, I won't understand the technical complications they'll face, but you know, what complications will they see? And, and I mean, is it going to succeed? I mean, they're already four years late. <laughs> well, <laughs> so, I, would, I would say that's that's a, a pretty yeah. significant indicator. Um, yeah. You know, basically, you're creating a new blockchain when when you do that. And I think what their their challenge is is, you know, like you said. 
um, Ethereum is far and away the most successful smart contract platform because it was the first, just like Bitcoin was the first cryptocurrency, Ethereum was the first smart contract platform. And you know, where Bitcoin is around one transaction or one block for every 10 minutes, Ethereum is on an order of 100 blocks per second or 100 blocks per minute, something like that. I think it's a minute. Yeah, it's a lot. That's a slide we're talking about, right? Yeah, that's exactly right. And then, and then there's like, like my favorite EOS, which is several thousand per second. And you know, consensus consensus is a real hard thing to change because you know it requires, especially on a widely distributed or decentralized platform, you have all these competing players who have competing. Um, motivations and for them to decide to switch over hey Bitcoin there's now what a dozen variants of forks yeah which all exist because certain collections of people did not want to follow with what the other people wanted so I think this question comes down more to less the technical possibility and more to game theory, right? Uh -huh. As far as like now that there are people who are incentivized to keep the network the same, there are people who have established their brand and their business enterprise, and the idea of Facebook making a new blockchain threatens right. that and will essentially upend what may exist currently. Um, so you start work, you start worrying about game theory concerns. It's like will enough people continue to support Ethereum? Will there be uh, some sort of uh, migration to other chains? Will there be a fork in order to maintain Ethereum as it exists now? Uh, and those kind of questions start to start to kind of pile into your question initially. It's like which blockchain comes down on top? I don't think that there's a blockchain that comes down on top necessarily, but I think that, like you said, there's going to be blockchain technology is going to be around, and you're going to be able to kind of pick and choose the protocol that fits your business needs or your whatever needs uh, based on that. So. And it'll touch every aspect of life, kind of the way the internet. Touches exactly. every aspect oh, yeah. of life. Absolutely. Now, and then, how are, can I zero in on just a couple of things you said around NFTs? Yeah, sure. I heard you say fad. I heard you say trend. You know, things like that, right? And, and NFT collectibles, I would agree. It's is you know obviously it's very volatile right now. But I see NFTs from a utility standpoint. Maybe this is a better question for the group than the technologist. But from a utility standpoint, when you have an NFT that cannot be you know, duplicated from a loyalty standpoint. Now I get access to certain things, right? And I don't see that as a fad necessarily. I see that as a. If you don't mind, I'll feel this one. This is like what I do. Um, okay. So you're kind of right, and that we're uh, there is utility and like there's provenance there. So like there, you're right that, that it will grow. Mm -hmm. As of right now, NFT utility is mostly it's kind of a fad and like it's gotten really hot and popular and a lot of the stuff that's trading for pretty significant value it's going to zero eventually. Yeah. Uh, right now, a lot of, there's a lot of what I do every day is speculating on what's going to last and I recognize that eventually the the real estate applications, the medical applications, the diplomas and the like education credentials and all, all this stuff is going to be the real world utility of blockchain and smart contracts and tokens. Um, but right now, we're kind of betting on like what's going to be historical, what's going to be still around, what's going to have been, like, what's going to be a long-term collectible because it was significant when it was only a novelty. Like yeah. we talked about where right now, the blockchain tech is still kind of a novelty and we're like all kind of figuring it out, playing with applications. And a lot of these NFTs that exist, especially that are very popular already today, um, will represent a very early collectible from those days, kind of a proof that I was there. Yeah, I was it's a badge, it. badge of honor, and, right? And exactly. So like most of it, and as more and more things come out, there's always a new shiny item and a new brand new tech, and something has to die in order for it to obtain value, essentially. <laughs> so 99% of stuff's going to continue to die off, and only the very best of the best, as far as the very speculative assets that exist and hold monetary value now, only the very top will, will continue to thrive there. So. Yeah. And so when I when I shop for projects, I'm looking for things that are going to have long-term yeah. And often, oftentimes, I always say that um, risk and reward are inversely related. 
You know what I mean? So you can you can take a, a, a 3x on something that's a little bit less riskier. You can try and get 100x on something, but the volatility is and your risk aversion is for you to decide. So. But I do believe in the technology for the long for the long haul because. Yeah. And, you know, I'm, I, I come from the media marketing space, and, and I, you know, I got a basic understanding of loyalty. This is basically a, you know, Web three version of loyalty, right? And the applications are like not even touched yet, as far as potential utility. And like, once somebody comes out and breaks out with a new protocol that just works well and provides some new utility that we don't quite understand yet, it will onboard a new group of people. And then somebody also innovate again, and they'll onboard a new group of people, and soon. We'll all be looking back and laughing at the dumb JPEG trades that we were doing. Yeah. But the ones that were great at the time will still remain relevant and they'll still be collectible. Um, so I, I always do tell people it's a very speculative asset class, and so you've got to be kind of careful with what you're doing. They're definitely nefarious actors, but um, yeah, the, the technology is barely in its infancy. Like it's just barely in its infancy right now. When did I Bor think it's like the, the ICO craze of 2016 where people were throwing out white papers with spelling errors and you know, cut and paste blocks of garbage and the, you know, but, but the, the coin and tele and other market media, you know, popularized it so much as it was the, I guess they call it FOMO, mm -hmm. the fact that everyone, everyone was jumping in and it was a lot of pump and dump and, you know, a lot of, a lot of people lost a lot of money and, Regulators stepped in and everything like that. I think today, NFTs today are, are the new shiny, and they're, they're like that where you know everyone wants to get in because you know some rapper spends ten million dollars for a picture of a goofy whatever, <laughs> and you know. But you're, you, I, I see the same trend. I, I see this is this is. This is the, the the fury before the before the sensible people show up. <laughs> and, and the FOMO is driving the industry right now. And you know, Facebook came into Meta and it's driving the industry right now. Just getting guys like me, like, hey, I want I want to play, right? <laughs> and you know, I, I look at things like real estate, right? Because you know, everybody's all about decentralized. Everybody's all about sandbox. You know, maybe Earth, what is Earth two or whatever. But there's you know, 300 other Earths out there, or 300 other, you know, lands, worlds out there that, that nobody knows about yet because they're still in development, because the development takes so long. So why invest in MySpace when, you know, Facebook's around the corner? That's probably. Exactly it. Yeah. And that's something when it comes to metaverse place specifically as an investment, you're, you're talking about being even earlier than to NFTs. Um, I think you'll probably back this well as a technologist, but uh -huh. I think that the technology that is required to to run the ready player one metaverse that we all imagine where mm -hmm. you, you know you're in there and it's just the reality of the world we live the technology and the data rate um the throughput that's required to actually support something like that and like the, even just like the internet speeds that are required uh at such scale literally doesn't exist yes. at this point in time and by the time it does come along to exist the big money's going to be in the space so there are a lot of these metaverse projects that are in in production right now they'll end up crushed because they're building on archaic what are not archaic now but what will be archaic platforms um that's something that i tell people a lot because nfts that's that's represented directly in the nft space and you know land plots and that kind of stuff in the metaverse people are trying to be really early what may be the next central land or the next sandbox but in reality the central land and sandbox may not survive yeah. um and when somebody like meta comes up with new technology that's able to actually produce um, my theory is that people care more about a working product than it, they do about a, a decentralization. I think that most onboarding to decentralized cryptocurrencies will require a failure of centralization. We kind of touched on that earlier when we touched on and that's CBDC. Well, don't you see that as a problem? Yeah. Least, but I think it's inevitable. I tell people all the time that I think the, those who care about decentralization, nobody's not heard of Bitcoin. Nobody's not heard of crypto anymore. Yeah. And those who care about decentralization are here now. And those who don't, will be onboarded by CBDCs because we're all used to spending digital points in our wallet right now. You don't pull cash out of your wallet anymore. Everybody's already onto that idea, but when the government backs it as a real dollar, everybody will use it. 
and then the government will have full and then you don't have, have full control and, and access to every transaction ever that you don't even have access to there will be abuse and there will be a failure and then there will be a need for decentralization but i think that the average public has to see a failure of centralization to understand and i think that that's likely what's going to happen with metaverse plays as well as somebody like meta will come out and they'll probably abuse their too much power and then at that point people will see value <laughs> outside of that Good. So uh, I want to continue this conversation, but we're going to go ahead and end this uh, this recording now. So I want everybody to thank Phil. For coming up share this that, was nice. um, that was really interesting. Thank you. And I'm going to go ahead and give you guys some in a look, quick look at the future, uh, the calendar here for Crypto World. So uh, let's see. Tomorrow we're going to be giving a, a presentation of the St. Charles Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we're going to be kind of answering the most common questions. Uh, debunking some some myths that are surrounding crypto right now thanks to the mainstream media. Um, Thursday is going to be a really big day. Uh, some of you guys have already met him, Xander. He's our diverse expert. He's going to become uh, to be a guest speaker at the uh, Bitcoin over beer event. That's going to be from six to eight thirty on Thursday. That'd be a great one to uh, bring people to. Uh, beer Sauce is going to be sponsoring. Uh, they're going to be bringing beer, and we're going to have some food as well. Uh, is it here? Hmm? Here, yeah, that will be here. Awesome. Yep. Um, now, the next Tuesday, so one week from today, the next guest speaker is going to be a crypto IRA group. Uh, so, for any of you guys who want to maybe consider rolling over your IRA into crypto, uh, they're going to be talking about that and they do that as a service. And then the next Thursday, which is the 24th, is going to be the biggest event of the month. We're partnering up again with uh, Michael Carter from Bitsby Trippin. Uh, we're going to have another Bitcoin over beer event at the T Rex building. Uh, this one is a, a limited seating to 100 people, and that's going to be from 5.30 to 9. Yeah, that's what that one is. Uh, and the topic is going to be NFTs. And um, unless something's changed, Devin's going to be the speaker for that one. Um, there are going to be some really important people flying in from New York City. <laughs> yeah, there's gonna be like some TikTok influencers, and that's going to be a lot of fun. So yeah, beer and food at that one as well. Or I'm sorry. Where are they out of New York? Uh, you gotta ask. I, 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 I'm, gonna, I'm gonna show up and I'm gonna tell the people what I gotta tell them. And I don't care where they came from. <laughs> yep. How do we get signed up for that? Uh, so all of those events can be found on Eventbrite. Um, I like it when you guys register for our events on Eventbrite because then I get a head count on how much food and coffee to get, but almost nobody does that anymore because <laughs> it's a weekly thing, you know, it gets tedious. Um, but you have to get tickets for the. 24th event at the T-Rex building. And that's at event, right? Right. Okay. Yeah. And what's cool, too, is that uh, the ticket that you get is actually going to be um, redeemable for an NFT at the event. Talk about Ooh, that. Yeah. Black yeah. Pedals, baby. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Oh, yeah. cool. So thanks <laughs> again, Phil. Oh, um, thanks, Phil. Good man. You guys can feel free to you know, continue this conversation. We're just going to go ahead and cut the cut the recording now, and uh, you guys can hang out for as long as you want. Thank you. I think Gary's out there too. He's going to want to say hi.